Okay, so the story, what I want to start is before we start with the story of Yisro, Jethro, who's the father-in-law of Moses, his daughter Zipporah married Moses, and why is the Torah portion called after Jethro, Yisro? Is the Torah portion of the Ten Commandments and giving of the Torah at Sinai, why is the Torah called the after Yisro Jethro? And the, there's a medrash that says that when the Jews were camped at Sinai, God did, was not ready to give the Torah till Yisro came, till Yisro joined the Jewish people. Very interesting insight. And we'll see why the Torah portion is called after Yisro. So I want to read two psukim from the beginning of the portion of the Torah. Vayishma Yisro, and Jethro heard. Who is Jethro? It says Kohen Midian, the priest of Midian. Chayson Moshe, the father-in-law of Moses. This is the opening passage. All that God had done for Moses and for the people of Israel. And the Lord that brought them out of Israel from Egypt. So why did Jethro go to the desert from Midian? Because he heard everything that happened to the Jewish people. What did he hear? Asks the Talmud. What did he hear? That he went running to be with his son-in-law. Question number one. Then in passage number five, I want to read. And it says, Vayava Yisrael Chaisen Moshe. And Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, came. Where did he come? El Hamidbar, into the wilderness. Where the Jewish people were camped at Mount Sinai. Okay, so we have two passages that describe what happened. He heard what happened to the Jewish people, and he came where? Into the desert. Now we know the Jewish people were in desert. Does it have to tell us where he came? Remember, the, the Torah always minces words. It doesn't give a detail unless the detail is necessary. Now say, I came to Diane's house in Westport. We know where Diane lives. Does it have to tell us that he came to the desert? We know they're in the desert. Where else are they? They're not in Baltimore, Maryland. So why does it emphasize that Jethro heard? What did he hear? And why does it have to say he came to the desert? So first of all, the Torah wants to emphasize what happened with Yisrael. Yeah, let's hear his background a little bit. Yisrael was the wealthiest, most powerful person in the Midian, in the whole surrounding area. He was the leader of the people there. Not only that, they say he was the priest of Midian. He knew every religion and every practice that the people of the area practiced. Because remember, they were all forms of idolatry and religions and practices. And he was an expert in every philosophy and religion of the area. So he was a high priest among the non-Jews or the non, remember no one was Jewish, the Israelites. The Torah made the Jewish people the Jewish people. So he was like this high priest. Now imagine I told you that Trump or Biden or Putin went to Israel, met with the chief rabbi. I want to convert to Judaism. What would you think of Shagayim? Either he's off the deep end, the something deep happened there. Good morning, day. Margaret. So this, but Yisrael going to the desert and going to be with the Jewish people and convert and accept the Torah with the Jewish people was a sensation. Everyone was talking about it. And I guarantee you it was on cable television. A guy gives up his political leadership, his religious leadership. He was the high priest of all the religions. He knew everything inside out. And yet he chooses to become a Jew, convert by that time to be a Jew before the giving of the Torah. You just have to accept that the God is God, God is the one. And then later on, of course, there is the halachic way to convert to Judaism. So this created a tremendous uproar that Yisro decides to give up his whole priesthood and become a Jew and get the Torah with the Jews. Who needs it? Look at the headaches they went through. So that's why the Torah portion is called Yisro. 
I think he called Yisro because he gave his father-in-law the whole idea of how to set up a hierarchy of judges. Remember, we discussed it last year. Moshe was the only judge. Yisro saw after the giving of the Torah, Moshe is the only judge. There's no other judges. So he create he helped Moshe create the Supreme Court and all the lower courts of law. And this helped alleviate the stress of having only one Supreme Court justice, which was Moshe. So that's another reason it's called Yisro. But it's called Yisro to show the man who left everything behind. Of course, he didn't give up his wealth. I mean, he's not necessary, but his whole way of life to join the Jewish people, to join the Jewish people. So that's why it's called Yisro. So now let's go back. And I want to, uh, I, I know we discussed this. So I'm not going to go that lengthy, but why did he go? It says because he saw what happened to the Jewish people. And the Talmud elaborates. And the reason I want to reiterate this point once again, even though I know I think we've done it in previous years, is because it's so relevant to what's happening in Israel now. It's so relevant to the anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish sentiment rising above in, in our world today that we're seeing now so evident came in, coming out of the woodwork. So the Talmud says there's three things that Yisro saw that made him want to come to be a part of the Jewish people. Rabbi Joshua says, I'm reading from the Talmud in English, he heard about the war of Amalek against the Israelites, and he came. Rabbi Elazar Hamudai says he heard of the giving of the Torah, so he came. And Rabbi Elazar says he heard about the splitting of the Reed Sea, so he came. So he heard about three things, and he was so inspired by these three things, he said, I'm coming to be part of the Jewish people. Now, the splitting of the sea was a magnificent miracle, and all the Egyptians drowned. I can imagine, Jane, you would want to come. The giving of the Torah, another sensational event, right, Margaret? You would want to come and see what's going on. But the fact that they fought a war with Amalek, what's so exciting about that? Who Actually, I would stay away from the Jewish people, because look how they're being attacked. It's actually disparaging to hear about the attack of Amalek, even though they won. Who wants to be part of people that are fighting in a war? That's not a time to go visit and be with the country that's at war. And you now, even though we see thousands of Jews are making Aliyah now, it's a miracle, Aliyah. So let's start with the first reason that he came. Why did he come? Because he heard about the war of Amalek. You have to understand what the war of Amalek was. What was the war of Amalek? Anybody know the story? They leave, they leave Egypt, right? There's a cloud of glory that protects them, like literally a cloud. There's a pillar of fire at night. There's a cloud under their feet so the scorpions don't bite. But what is what, what happens? Anybody know the story? Why do, why do we say in our prayers every day, erase the memory of Amalek? And in every generation, we Amalek, we erase the memory of Amalek. By the way, Haman from the Purim story comes from Amalek. You know how Haman was born? Because the Jews had compassion and they didn't kill out all the Amalek and they felt bad, right? They felt bad. They said, God told us to erase every Amalek. But you know what? Let's not be radical. And that's how Haman was born. The one Amalek that remained alive gave birth to Haman. And look what happens generations later because they didn't listen to God. But why are we so adamant? Is God a vicious, vengeful God that he tells us in every generation you should be destroying Amalek? Does it, can anybody think of, of, of a little rationale here? Well, what did Jethro see in this war? So you have to understand what happened. The Jews leave Egypt. Now we're not talking about 500 relatives sitting on a bus, on a charter bus. We're talking about thousands and thousands of Jews, men, women, and children. Now they're traveling, right? They come a, co co come a country. They come to a certain country. They camp. They ask permission. Can we camp here? Yes. We need to buy supplies. We need food and water. And they pay, right? So every country they came through, 
they were very peaceful, a Jewish nation. They didn't say, oh yeah, God is gonna miraculously protect us. We're not gonna pay for the food, water, and supplies. We deserve it, we were slaves. No, every place they came, they asked permission at the border patrol. The border patrol gave them permission. They buy the supplies, they buy the food. Then God tells them, move on. Now they're coming to the Amalekim, wherever they lived, I don't remember. And the Amalekim attack them for no reason. They didn't attack them because, hey, they're not going to pay for the food. Hey, they didn't get a passport to come to our borders. And it says, who did they attack first? The disabled, the weak, the exhausted, the ones that were not under the cloud of glory, the laggers. They attacked the vulnerable first. And of course, God killed them out, didn't let them attack. The Jews won the war with the help of God. But that's who they attacked. Now, why did they attack? Anybody know from what I just said? They decided, oh, we don't like those Jews. We don't want them here. We don't want them to exist in this world. So there was no reason for the attack. It was baseless hatred for no reason. Why don't you like me? A girl asks the bully at school. I don't like you because I don't like your face. I don't like you. You're weird. And they bully this person at school mercilessly. Why? Because they don't like her or him. The Amalekim said, we don't like the Jews. You don't deserve to exist. Was it a land dispute? Was it a money dispute? Was it an issue of any dispute? No. They just decided to. And the chutzpah. They just saw what happened in Egypt. They just heard what happened in Egypt. What did they think? They think God left the Jews suddenly and they're going to win? So the chutzpah, the audacity of the Amalekim. And that's what Yisrael saw. He saw baseless hatred. But this doesn't explain it. So why do you want to be part of a people that are hated for no reason? Because he realized if these people, the Jewish people are hated with such passion with such hate deep rooted unbased hate there must be something very divine holy and special about them <laughs> he realized there's something who hates a person for no reason there must be something very special about the jewish people so the war against Amalek and the audacity of Amalek made him realize there's something very special about those Jewish people, those Israelites. I'm going to go check it out. I'm going to go to them. Well, so especially what? because they won. <laughs> yeah, but 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 sometimes even when, when you win, do you want to be part of conflict? You stay away from conflict. You want to go to now Ukraine and Russia? You like you you don't want to be part of war in a sense. Yeah, you want to be part of the cool girls at school. You don't want to be with the one that's the Nebuch case that everyone picks on, you know? It's a it's 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 the mentality, the, the what do you call it? The herd mentality. You want to be with the winners, yes, you want to be with the winners, the Jews, but you also don't want to be the ones that are like always picked on. But so I want to now analyze this one more step deeper, which we never discussed. So what was the difference between Paro and the Egyptians and the Malaykim? Why don't we say in every generation, we should hate Paro, the Egyptians. In every generation, we should erase the Egyptians. We don't say that. We only say it about Amalek. Does any, can anybody think of the reason we don't say it about Paro, but we say it about the Amalekim in our prayers every single day? Why the emphasis on the Amalekim? Erase the Amalekim, but not the, why not also Paro? He was terrible. He tortured, killed Jews and children. He was horrible. He's a, a Nazi, worse than a Nazi. Diane, you have an idea? Maybe because Paro, even though he it was wrong, he believed in you know gods and the, the Amalekim had just baseless evil in their hearts, you know, like vehement anti-Semitism from this, the source. Well, you hit, awful. You, you, you hit something there. You hit something there. Anybody else? Margaret, Jane? What? Yeah, go ahead. Wasn't, 
weren't they descendants of Esau? Yes. So so they had this like uh built in, they were taught the hatred from the time they were born. Very good. Good. And it's a systemic, you know, they don't even know what they're fighting about anymore. They they just were a little bit um very scrappy around the edges and not able to uh maybe put one foot in front of the other to achieve their potential and they were so frustrated and they needed a scapegoat um you know but it seems like a, it should have dissipated after the generations and after so i don't know i mean that's a very good thing. I didn't think of the Esau, connect, Esau connection, but it's true. It says Esau hates Yaakov. So it's a generational DNA. It's in the DNA of Amalek. But uh, yeah, anybody else want to? That, that's a beautiful insight also. So two, 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 Margaret, oh, anything? Ugly. <laughs> okay. No, it's a massive. Uh, yes. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for Margaret. That the Egyptians, uh, that the Egyptians brought Moses. The Egyptians. That Moses was part of that. Oh, you say Moses came um, to the Egyptians? Brought out. That most raised by the Egyptians. Okay, maybe. So it wasn't as vicious. You're saying. <sighs> So there's a psychological and Kabbalistic insight here, but all of you are on the right track, actually. So what, what did Paro say to Moses when he came? Let my people go. God said, let my people go. He says, who's your God? I don't know your God. I'm God. Remember Paro said he's the God. So Paro's fight was with God. I don't believe your God because I'm the God. Show me your God. Who's your God? So what happens to a guy that denies God? He falls into the ocean and disappears. Right. Done. Finished. We don't have to hear his commentary anymore. He's swallowed up by the ocean. But Amalek is a much different, devious type of hate. Amalek, they, remember I said, they, who did they attack first? The vulnerable, weak. the weak, the exhausted ones, the disabled ones. Amalek preys on the weak. Amalek bullies and says, who are you? Not who is your God. Amalek attacks the person, the man, the woman, the child. The, it becomes personal, personal attack. When someone attacks God, it's a theological attack. It, it doesn't mean it's good. But that guy falls in the ocean, boom, gone. The Amalekim is a challenge that we face every day of our lives. What do we ask ourselves sometimes? Who am I? Do I deserve to live? Why am I here? Why am was I born? Am I even adding anything to this universe? Mm -hmm. So many times we doubt ourselves. So Amalek is not only a physical enemy. Amalek is the enemy within that comes up all the time and says, do you deserve to live? Who are you? What contribution do you even make to this world? You're exhausted. You're weak. So every single day we have to erase that within ourselves, in our attitudes in life. That we matter. That God put us here for a purpose, a mission. And imagine the Jews in Israel in fighting this war, what they're being told. You don't deserve to live in this land. The Amalekim are telling them, who are you? By their acts. And the way they indoctrinate their children. You spoke about that. It's in the DNA. It's in the DNA. They, The Gazans, what's in their school textbooks? What videos do they, they're showing? The horrors, what they're, how they're educating their children to hate Jews only because they're Jews. So Amalek is the enemy within that doubts us and says, you know, maybe I shouldn't be living in this land. Maybe I didn't do, get it as my inheritance. Maybe we should give it away to the Hamas, to the Arabs. After all, yeah, we'll right. have peace. Maybe we'll have peace. <laughs> so Amalek is the concept of doubting ourselves externally and internally. And that's why God says every day, Timcha Zeit Amalek. 
Do not allow that to in, creep into your psyche and take you over and battle against you. You have to every day tell yourself, no, 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 no. I was created. I am worthy. And God wants me here. So Paro, the ideology, ideology of Paro could be drowned. Someone comes to me and says, Fredo, why do you believe in God? There's no God. I'm like, okay, go take yourself a little hike. And you're done with that person because they're not attacking you. They're attacking God. God can handle himself, so to speak, or herself. But when someone comes and says, you're not worthy, who the heck needs you? You don't belong here. What do you start saying? You know, maybe they're right. Now that's the danger of Amalek. It's a personal attack. So when Yisro saw the attack for the only, no, I hit you because I want to hit you. I'm attacking you because I want to attack you because you're weak. He said, there must be something special about these people, the unprovoked attack. Like it says, show me your enemy and I will tell you who you are. Draw up a list of your enemies. And when you draw up that list, you will see who you are. Stalin, Hitler, Saddam Hussein, Abdel Nasser, Yasser Arafat, Osama bin Laden, hundreds wow. and hundreds, Nasrallah, Soleimani. <laughs> Seeing who hates the Jews, it's a source of Jewish pride. Look at these monsters who hate the Jews. It shows who the Jews really are. They're hated for no reason other than because we're Jewish. And when he saw that, he saw, he saw that the people of the Jewish people are something very, very, very special. Then comes the second, second um, reason. He says he saw the giving of the Torah. So what's so special about the giving of the Torah? Because he saw what the Torah represents. Remember, he was a master of every religion. He knew every idolatry, every paganism, every ism. And yet he uh -huh. chose the Torah. Why? Listen to what it says. What did he realize? He realized that what is the Torah? Education, charity, justice, compassion, loving the stranger, respecting wow. the slave, feeding the poor, honoring the old, giving dignity to the sick and those who are challenged. When he saw the mitzvahs and the ethics and morals of the Torah and that no one is above the law and everyone is created in God's image, he saw what the Torah contained. He says, that's for me. No religion that I know comes to that can compare to God's wisdom, God's Torah. You know the story of Pascal, the famous scientist, right? Louis the Fourteenth of France was the king, and Pascal was a famous scientist. He says to his buddy, the scientist, or his advisor, or his confidant, Pascal, tell me, Monsieur, what is proof that there's a God? Is there a proof? So Pascal looks at the king. He says, Your Majesty, the proof is the Jewish people and their history. You want proof there's a God? Look at the Jewish people and their history. That's what it is. So that's what Jesro, Yisro saw. Yisro saw what a Torah is. He says, oh, that one, come on, can't compare. And that's what made him come. Go ahead, Diane, what did you want to say? I just have to share a quick story, if that's yes, okay. Please. I love it. So our former rabbi, um, was not raised Jewish. His father was a minister. And in his theological studies, he was studying the Jewish people. And he studied and studied and was so taken, he said the same thing. That's who I want to be and converted. And it's just incredible power of, of us, of our history, of our teachings. Yes, exactly. Exactly. That's a beautiful story, Diane. Thank you. Anybody else want to share anything? Never be shy. <laughs> never, never be shy. 
So yeah, so now that you said that, let me tell you what Mark Twain. You know, I'm a very big uh, fan of Mark Twain. <laughs> I love Mark Twain. He I loved, didn't know that. He, so Mark Twain met Shalom Aleichem. You know, Mark Twain met Shalom Aleichem. You ever heard the story? Shalom Aleichem, the famous author. So he says to Shalom Aleichem, "I hear you're the Jewish Mark Twain." <laughs> <laughs> Shalom Aleichem, who was a secular Jew, was not so into his Judaism, says to Mark Twain, no, I am the Jewish Mark Twain, he says. <laughs> Love it. He didn't Love like it. that Mark Twain uh, called him the Love Jewish it. Shalom Aleichem. <laughs> That's just crazy. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to write, read you something Mark Twain wrote. In 1899, when anti-Semitism was very widespread in the New United States, duh, what else is new? Large companies didn't hire Jews. Universities didn't admit Jews. They had quotas. And people like Ford and Edison were very openly anti-Jewish. So Mark Twain in Harper's Magazine wanted to respond to the anti-Semitism. This is what he writes. I'll read a small part because it's quite long. If the statistics are right, the Jews constitute but 1% of the human race. It suggests a nebulous dim puff of stardust lost in the blaze of the Milky Way, he writes. Properly, the Jew ought hardly to be heard of, but he is heard of and has always been heard of. He is as prominent on the planet as any other people and his commercial importance is extravagantly out of proportion to the smallness of his bulk. I'll read one more paragraph. His contributions to the world's list of great names in literature, science, art, music, finance, medicine, and obtuse learning are also way out of proportion to the weakness of his numbers. He has made a marvelous fight in this world in all the ages and has done it with the hands tied behind him. The Greeks and the Romans followed and made a vast noise and they are gone. The Egyptians, the Babylonians and the Persians rose. They filled the planet with sound and splendor and faded to dream stuff and passed away. What is the secret of this immortality? So he That's is Mark Twain. It's Mark amazing. Twain. Right, yeah. he wrote this in Harper Magazine. In 18, you understand when he wrote this? He wrote this in 1899. When I saw this, I printed out, I said, I have to read it. So powerful. You know yeah. what it is? If a Jew Amazing. wrote this, you could say, ah, oh. you wrote it. Yeah. Right. A, a non-Jew writes it, it has weight. And, and in a way I could see why, because he's, he's not Jewish. He doesn't have a reason to write this. What does he have with the Jews? Did they pay him off? So that's why it's so powerful. Also, by the way, Tolstoy wrote something uh, very, very beautiful in 1891. I'll just read one little paragraph. He wrote, what is a Jew? The answer given to the question posed is, a Jew is that sacred being who has brought down from heaven the eternal fire and has illuminated with it the entire world. He is the religious source, spring, and fountain out of which all the rest of the nations have drawn their beliefs and religions. He writes a whole huge paragraph. This is Tolstoy, also. Not exactly a Jew lover, by the way, but yet wrote what he saw as the truth. And he ends with this. Christian people do not possess any moral principles, and the result is that hate, and persecutions abound. He explains why there's so many persecutions. Again, he's a non-Jew writing why there's persecutions. The result is hate and persecutions abound, he writes. So you see that if you are honest about the history and the analysis, this is the only really conclusion you can come to. Oh, there's really no reason for the persecution. Sorry, Jane, go ahead, what? They're almost like on modern day Yithros. Yeah. Not quite Tolstoy, but you know, Mark Twain. I always look for the Yithros, you know, when 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 we have support outside, you know, mm -hmm. when, when the non-Jews say something, it holds more weight than when the Jews say it, of course. But we still have to speak up for ourselves because yeah. at the end of the day, 
You never know uh, who's going to come be on your side. So when he saw this, and he saw what the Torah represents, he came. And then the third reason he came, and we'll end with this part of Yisro, was he saw the splitting of the sea. Now, why doesn't it say the plagues? Right? That was also a huge miracle. But it says, what did he see? The supernatural quality that the Jews don't live, live only in the natural world. There's a supernatural life that we experience. Like uh, my mother always, my mother and my brother-in-law have this joke. We depend on miracles. That is our life. <laughs> Everything is a miracle. So because he could have sat on his hammock, sipping a Mai Tai, smoking a Cuban cigar, and he could read the Torah. He could buy the Torah book in the local marketplace and read it. Does he have to become a Jew? You like it? Read it. Take it out of the library. It's a bestseller. But no, he saw that the life of the Jew is a supernatural above rhyme and reason. With rhyme and reason, but above the natural universe. And this is our secret. That's how we survived. Because logically, rationally, could we have survived till this day? No, it has to be we have a supernatural resource that transcend, transcends nature and natural history. How come we're still here? It doesn't make sense. The Germans are gone. The Romans are gone, as we just read. The Greeks are gone. All we have is matzah to remember Paro. Latkes to remember the, 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 the Greek Syrians. And Hamantashen to remember the, 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 the mm. Haman and the Malakim. We, we turn all our enemies into food. <laughs> 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 We're very positive people. Matzah balls on Pesach. Yeah, we're remembering Mitzrayim. Don't forget the matzo balls. <laughs> don't forget the greasy latkes, Greek Syrians. And don't forget those hamantashen for the Amalekim. We're very positive people. <laughs> Every time we have an enemy, a new recipe is born. <laughs> That's great. We love it. <laughs> That's the Jewish approach to life. Now you know why we're obsessed with food. <laughs> Because the, <laughs> the food represents our lives. <laughs> Did you make the charosa? I love charosa, by the way. You know, there's a custom before the Seder, you don't taste the foods of the Seder because you want it to be unique, right? The taste. But me, when I make the charosa, I try to do it a day or two before Pesach. Well, I want to taste it. I love it. So if you do it the day of Pesach in the morning, you're not supposed to. So I do it two days before because I like to eat a few students. <laughs> so, yeah, we turn our enemies into food. Jews, we celebrate life. We don't allow ourselves to fall into the abyss. So when Yisro saw that the Jewish life is above the confines of nature, that we live a miraculous life, that was the deal for him. That was it. That was the finding thing. They live miraculously. Their lives are not defined by the confines of nature. They have a book that gives them the basic moral and ethics to be a good human being. And three, there's a divine holiness in the Jew that makes them be hated. And I want to be part of those people. So that's why Yisro joins the Jewish nation. And he becomes a very pivotal, important person. He sets up the whole Supreme Just Court system. He helps his son-in-law. And that's why the Torah says, till Yisrael came, the Torah could not be given. He added that dimension that people understood now. Sometimes you need someone from the outside to say, you know, you got it good. You got it good. Does anybody want to add anything before we uh, move on to the to, to the giving of the Torah, which is so powerful? So by the way, the Torah was given for the imperfect person. The Torah was given to us. The Torah was given to a nation of people made up of all types of personalities. The Torah is not meant for the perfect 
human being. The Torah is not meant for the angels. As a matter of fact, there's a medrash that tells a story that when Moses went up to the mountain, right, to get the teachings of the Torah, he encountered a, an argument going on. There was a dialogue. The angels came to God. This is right before the giving of the Torah. You're giving the Torah to those people down there. You know what kind of people they are? You think they're going to keep it? Go look into the future. You'll see. They're going to worship idolatry. They're going to desecrate the Shabbos. They're never going to keep the mitzvahs. Why are you giving it to them? They're imperfect people. They're never going to be able to keep the Torah. So God looks at Moses, says, Moses, can you please respond to these angels here? <laughs> these fellows. So Moses began to tremble. He says, if I respond to the angels, they'll burn me alive. You know, the angels have power. God said, don't worry, hold on to my throne. No one will harm you. So God, Moses looks at the angels and he says, let me ask you something. It says the first commandment, I am the Lord, your God, who took you out of Egypt. When was the last time you were in Egypt in slavery? He asks the angels. Were you there? Were you enslaved? They said, no. And then it says, do not have any other gods besides me. Second commandment. Do, would you even think of worshiping another god? He asks the angels. The angel says, no, we can only worship one god. We, we, we don't have free choice. We're not human beings. And then he keeps asking them, do you work so hard that you have to rest on Shabbos? <laughs> do you exert yourself? The angel said, no. So everyone, do you have parents? It says, honor your mother and father. Do you have a mother? Do you have a father? The angel said, no. So God, Moses says to the angels, well, why do you think the Torah is for you? It has to be for the human beings, for the Jewish people who, who can relate to what the Torah tells them to do. So the angels acquiesced and they showered Moses with gifts because they realized the Torah is not for the perfect angel. The Torah is for you and me. The imperfect person. Yes, the person who's going to at times deny God. The person at times who's going to do things that go against Torah and mitzvahs. Exactly. That's who God gave the Torah to. If God wanted perfection, God would have given it to the angels. Let's give it to somebody who will epitomize perfection. A robot a robot who can only do what is programmed, but God gave it to you and me. So anytime you think, it's a Torah for me, it's for you, it's for me. That's who God gave it to. And that's why, very interestingly, and before I go to this, I want to re remember the Rashi. Rashi says to Mo, I mean, God says to Moshe, Kai samar lebeis Yaakov v'sagid l'bnei Yisrael. Go teach the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel. So the famous, and I say it every year because we have to keep saying it. Why the repetition? God says, teach the children of Jacob. Who are the children of Jacob? Us. And then go teach and tell it to the children of Israel. Who, again, us. Remember, Jacob had two names, Jacob and Israel. He was called Jacob. Then he wrestled with the host angel and became Israel. So we're called the children of Israel. We're also called the children of Jacob. So Rashi says, teach B'nai Beis Yaakov, teach the women first, the Torah. V'sagid l'b'nai Yisroel, then teach the men. So I always emphasize this Rashi because to, to underline more and more the people who say women are not regarded, the Torah is not for the women, it's only for the men, it's a masculine religion. God told Moses, teach the women first. You know why? God tells Moses, they will remain with the Jewish people forever and ever because they're the foundation of the home of the children of life, of education. And that's why Sarah Shnira, I don't know if you know this, famous Rebetzin started Beis Yaakov. All the Jewish yeshivas in the early days were called wow. Beis Yaakov after this Rashi. So I grew up, my school was based Rifka, named after Rebetzin Rifka, one of the Chabad Rebetzins. But in the early years, there was no Chabad schools. The only Chabad, yesh the only Jewish yeshivas for girls were called Beis Yaakov. My mother went to Beis Yaakov. 
Because that time Chabad was teeny. There was no Bells Yish girls yeshiva, Satma girls yeshiva. One yeshiva for all the girls was Beis Yaakov all over the world. And my mother went to Beis Yaakov. Why is it called Beis Yaakov? Because of this Rashi. God says to Moshe, teach the women first. And you know the story also, just again, remember, God tells Adam, right, at the beginning of creation, don't eat from the tree of knowledge. Adam goes off to his wife. He says, honey, I wanted to remind you what God said. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge and don't touch the tree of knowledge. He added, he thought he'll be a chacham. And then when the snake pushes her against the tree and nothing happened, she says, oh, my husband lied to me. I touched the tree, nothing happened. I surely could eat from the tree. So God says, tell it to the women. They're going to repeat it verbatim. They're not going to add any little tidbits. They're not going to decide to add any mitzvahs or change it around. The way I said it will be the way it will be transmitted. So God tells Moshe, teach the women first. So after the revelation at Sinai, when Moses set up the schools, he forced taught the women, and then they taught the men. Just a very, very important to reiterate this. So many times I share it because of women who feel that the Judaism is a male religion. Women are relegated to the house. They can eat. You must have 11 children because Freda has 11 children. <laughs> and, and that's it. You're locked up in the house. You're forced to stand behind a, a cholent pot 24 <laughs> 7. She says it in the Torah, no? <laughs> you had no surprise how many people have stereotypes. Somebody asked me if I speak English. I'm like, no, I don't speak English. <laughs> All. I only speak Yiddish and Hebrew because if I spoke English, I'd be too emancipated. <laughs> I love to make jokes when people ask me because I find humor sometimes, you know, dissipates a little tension. Uh -huh. I remember was I was uh, asked to speak in a debate. So there was a reform rabbi, a conservative rabbi, females and me. So I said to them before the lectures, each one of us would speak. I'm like, I don't like confrontation. I really don't. I, I, I shy away from confrontation. Whereas I have brothers that love to debate, like a Ben Shapiro type, but I, I get very nervous. So I said to them, I hope you would mind if we just keep it very civil. And it was, it was very, very civil. So one lady gets up and the topic was feminism and Judaism. And she begins to uh, lament and, 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 and debate and scream about, she went to Jerusalem to a shul and there was separate seating. And it was horrible because you know, the men and women are separate. And the curtain was dirty. The curtain that separated the men and women was so dirty. And she kept, emphasizing that. She said, what do you have to say with that, Rebetz and Freda? I'm like, I'll tell you what I really have to say about that. I feel like they need a balabasta to go in there and wash those, those curtains <laughs> and make the place spotless. It's a chil Hashem that a synagogue is so dirty. That's not nice. And her mouth flew open like there was no tomorrow. And she sat herself down. I don't think she wanted an answer. So I addressed the dirty curtain. <laughs> I didn't address the issue because it was not, that's what I'm trying to say. Sometimes my husband taught me this. You don't have to have an answer for everything, which I don't. I'm no genius. But also, sometimes it's a person just expressing themselves. And you have a right to say it. You have a right to say, you know, it's so hard for me to, eat, to, to keep kosher. It's so hard for me not to have a cheeseburger. You could say it. Doesn't mean you're a bad person. And you don't always have to have an answer for everyone's pain or unhappiness with a certain mitzvah. I could tell you many mitzvahs I find very difficult and I'm unhappy about doing. You understand what I'm trying to say? So Torah is for the imperfect person. Torah is not for the person that is, oh my gosh, I'm the righteous one in the world and no one else is righteous. Now, how do we see it? In the opening remarks. God says, So the Jews are now standing at the mountain. They're not allowed to touch the mountain, God said, because God descended. And, you know, we're using human terms. God descends upon the mountain. And God starts speaking the Ten Commandments on the uh, above Zion, sixth day of Sivan. 
And God says, I am your God, your God who took you out of Egypt. And that opening line, the whole Torah is defined. Why? First of all, the word Anochi is not Hebrew, by the way. Did you know that? It's Egyptian. God could have said, Ani, Hashem Aleichem. I am your God, your God. Why does God say Anochi, Egyptian? You're giving mm -hmm. the Torah and you're using a foreign language. Anybody know? Why would God use a foreign language as his opening line? Because it wasn't there for, it was not foreign to them. Very good. Excellent, Jane. Exactly. When you meet a, a person and you and, and you know this trepidation, this fear, God is coming. You know, they didn't see God, but they felt the presence, like, you know, the divine spirit and God's voice through Moshe. They were so scared. It was so, it says that they died practically. Their souls left their body. It was so overwhelming. It ever happened to you? You were so overwhelmed. You felt like you're going to faint. So God wanted to endear himself. You meet a child. You don't go, I'm your grandmother. You go, hi, sweetie pie. You like ice cream? I'm your buddy, <laughs> right? You don't want to scare the child. So God said, I'm Nike in Egyptian. When they heard their mamaloshin from their, like what Jane said, right away, they felt more calm. God speaking to me in my language. So God right away showed the Jewish people the Torah is not for a foreigner. It's for you. You. You who left Egypt. Not you who's been living in a pristine, beautiful life your whole life. Because remember, every day we leave Egypt. The story of Egypt is not a story that only happened then. Again, it's the same thing like Amalek. Egypt means, comes from the word limitations, boundaries, Every day of our lives, there's things that hold us back, things that pull us away from who we're meant to be. And that creates, that's why we're unhappy at times, sad, depressed, moody, because we there's internal conflict. There's an internal Egypt within us. So God says, I'm God, your God, that took you out of Egypt. That's who I am. Now, why didn't God say, I'm God, your God, who created heaven and earth? Isn't that more spectacular? Isn't that more universal? You know who I am? I'm the creator of heaven and earth. But again, God was speaking to you, to me. You know who I am? I'm God that just took you out of Egypt. Heaven and earth is a beautiful representation, but it's not personal. It's theological. It's philosophical. But imagine I say, you know, Margaret, you know who I am? I'm the one that gave you a million dollars to buy whatever you want. I'm the one that took you out of bondage. I'm the one that biked you a birthday cake. It's personal, the Torah. God is trying to tell the Jewish people, I'm not looking to have a relationship of the heavens. I'm looking to have a practical relationship with you. So Anochi, I'm the one who took you out of Egypt. Remember me? I'm the one that took you to the aquarium. And bought you every souvenir <laughs> in the gift shop. I'm, 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 um, I'm making it personal. I just took my grandchildren to the aquarium. Boy, was that an experience. <laughs> Bobby, can I have this? Can I have that? So this uh -huh. is. Just, I hope you don't mind if I tell this personal thing very quickly. So I take them, and they're of course starving and hungry, right, kids? So there's a there's a snack shop. I'm like, okay, we're gonna get a snack. So they right away spot the kosher chips. I mean, their mother taught them well. They found the potato chips with an okay and the snapple with the okay. So I sit them down, but I oh, sit them down. So expensive. Listen, so this is the story. <laughs> so I sit them down all the way in the back because I don't want it to be like I bought non-kosher food. I don't want it to seem like, you know. So one of them says, little Miriam, who's uh, five years old, says, Bobby, we love you. Mommy never lets us go to the snack shop. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> <laughs> because it's expensive right i didn't let my kids go either by the way it's a mother thing we're not paying 9.99.99 for potato chips back it's it 89 cents but guess what they're starving now <laughs> you know the, the mentality of a, of a thrifty mother is not the same as a bubby no. and, and so i felt so proud of myself i can't explain it I felt like that defined my life. You know? Of course it does. That's it. 
That's yeah. the whole purpose. So that bought me, that's it. I love them forever now. <laughs> so God is making the whole Torah giving per personal, personal. It's 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 for you I'm giving the Torah. Anoki, I'm giving you the Torah. So there's one more little tidbit with this section before I say one more thing and then I'll uh, conclude with a story. The last of the Ten Commandments, people always say though, the Ten Commandments, and we will talk more about it when the holiday of Shruas comes, encapsulates all 613 mitzvahs. So though God uttered the Ten Commandments at the giving at Sinai, then you know what happens. Moses goes up to the mountain. He learns the whole Torah with God. He comes down, he breaks the tablets, he goes back up, he goes down, he goes back up, and eventually he brings them the Torah scrolls that we have now, he, the five books of Moses. That's the giving of the Torah in a nutshell. So the last of the Ten Commandments is do not covet everything your neighbor has. And it mm -hmm. lists, do not covet their goats, do not covet their camels, do not covet their ox, Wild. and it ends up their house, and everything your neighbor has. So why does it have to say everything your neighbor has? It already said the ox, the house. You assume it's everything, right? So I saw a very beautiful thing from Rabbi Gordon, Oliver Shalom from California. He says that many times you look at your neighbor. It doesn't mean neighbor physically, but your friend. You say, I wish I had my friend's life. She has the most handsome husband, such a successful husband. Look at those children, straight A students. Look at that house, the cars. The vacations they take, wow. I wish I could have her life. So God says, yeah, if you covet your neighbor's life, you're going to get the whole life. You don't only get what you see. You're going to get also the tsaras, the fighting, the things you don't see behind their mm -hmm. polished, glossy externals. If you want to change your life for theirs, remember, you could do it. Theoretically, but you have to take the whole package. You can't just take what you like. Oh, I'll take her money, but I won't take her house. I'll take her car, but I don't want her vacation. Uh, you know, you can't pick and choose. Jealousy, you want it, you got it all. And then you see behind the scenes, not everything is as perfect as it seems. Because no one has everything perfect. There's, I mean, halavai, but no one has everything lined up and there's never any challenges, there's never any problems, there's never any disputes, there's never any issues. It's impossible. We're living in a world of darkness and a world of challenges and a world of many trials and tribulations. But if you want to be jealous, God says, take it all. And then you'll see the grass is not greener on the other side. So that's why it ends off with everything your neighbor has. You want it? You want it? You get everything. You only get what you want. So there's much more to say, but it's 11 o'clock. So I want to end off with, 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 with two stories that I just read that I think are so uh, tell us what we got in the Torah, what we got. So one story is happened in Azerbaijan, which is part of Ukraine, I think. So a Jewish woman, unfortunately, intermarried with a Greek Orthodox man. He wasn't necessarily religious. And when their daughter was eight, nine years old, they decided the wife was Jewish. So she said, you know, let me give my daughter, we're living in such a faraway place as Benajan, whatever it's called, Aserbarjan, sorry, Aserbarjan, it's a true story. Let me give her a Jewish education. So she found like a Hebrew school and she sent her daughter, her daughter loved it. And her daughter started to do Jewish things. She started to light Shabbos candles Friday. And she started to like not mix milk and meat. And the husband notices that his nine-year-old daughter, what he thought was cutesy doing these mitzvahs, he's now looking at it like, you know what? It's getting a little bit much. This is not exactly what I envisioned. So he calls his wife. He says, you know, you gave your daughter, a Jew our daughter a Jewish education because you're Jewish, but I think now it's also my turn 
I'm going to take her to the Greek Orthodox Church and let her become learn about the Greek Orthodox Church and let her convert. So he tells the daughter. The wife has no choice. He says to his wife, and if you don't agree, she can't go to Jewish school anymore. So the wife doesn't know what to say. She says, okay. But the nine-year-old girl doesn't want it. She says, no, I don't want to. I want to be Jewish. I like being Jewish. Mommy is Jewish. But he forces her. He takes her to the priest. And the priest is, goes through all the things that you have to do. He's going to baptize you. You're going to have to say this blessing. You're going to have to say this prayer. And though she's, she, she describes that in her mind, she was singing the Jewish prayers and the, repeating in her mind the Jewish stories and prayers to like avoid hearing the voice of the priest. Finally, he takes her over to a table where there's a candle. And he says, and you have to light this candle. This is part of the process. She looks up at the clock. She realizes it's Friday right before uh -huh. candle lighting. So she lights the candle. She goes like this. And before they know it, she says, She makes the blessing on the Shabbos candle in the church. The priest and the father are like horrified. So you ask, everybody, it says every soul from every generation was at Sinai. All future generations and all past mm. generations stood at Sinai. Every Jew has to climb their mountain. Every one of us has to take on the Torah. And on that day, this nine-year-old girl, she climbed her mountain. She lit Shabbos candles. Wherever she was, she lit the Shabbos candles. That's why there's that site, I saw you at Sinai, it's a matchmaking service. Because I saw you at Sinai. You were there. It. I was there. Let's make a match. <laughs> I love it. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to end off with this. Another one little story. Because again, it's about a teenager. So there's this 13-year-old boy. He's in public school in California. Rabbi Brisky tells the story. but he, he knew the parents. And the boy in public school got very interested in Judaism. He went to Hebrew school. And he convinces his parents that after elementary school, he's going to go to yeshiva high school, which is, you know, they study half a day English studies, half a day Jewish studies, but more intense. His parents say, very good. We're not so happy, but okay. The grandfather is a very wealthy industrialist. And he hears that his grandson is going to a Jewish day school, high school, yeshiva, no less. So... He speaks to his daughter and his son-in-law, and they said, listen, we can't dissuade him. He does what he wants. He says, I'm going to come fly down to meet with him. He flies down to California. He calls up his grandson. He said, Joey, can we have dinner tonight? He said, sure, Grandpa, but it has to be a kosher restaurant. <laughs> the grandfather says to Joey, and uh, no, 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 thinking himself, I'm not going to be caught dead in a kosher restaurant. Let's go to Starbucks. <laughs> Starbucks is kosher coffee. So he says, okay, Grandpa, you sure? He says, yeah. They meet in Starbucks. And he starts chit-chatting, avoiding the issue. And finally, the grandfather says, so what are your future plans? You know, I really want you to go to an Ivy League college. I'm going to pay your tuition. He says, Grandpa, I have to tell you, I love Judaism. I want to go to Yeshiva, college, Yeshiva High School. He says, really? You'll never get into Ivy League if you go to Yeshiva. You'll never get into Ivy League. Don't do it. Don't do it. He says, no, Grandpa, I made up my mind. He says, Joey, I'm going to give you $10,000 a month to go to public school, public high school. Grandpa, no, 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 I really want to go. I'm going to give you $15,000 a month, he tells him. True story. No, Grandpa, I really want to go to Yeshiva. Grandfather's thinking, he says, okay, this is my final offer. I'm going to give you $700,000 in an interest-bearing account by the time you're 21, you can have the money, and I could tell you, you'll be a multi, multi-millionaire. It's going to be invested amazingly. Just go to public high school, and you go to Ivy League College, and that's the path you should take. He says, no, Grandpa, I want to tell you something. I was given a great gift that cannot be bought by money, he says. And I hope one day, Grandpa, you will also 
accept this gift. This is what he told his grandfather, the gift of the Torah. So you hear two kids, a nine-year-old, a 13-year-old, each one, they climb their mountain. You ask yourself why, because this is the story of the Jewish people. We all have to climb our mountain. We all have to accept that Torah. Yes, to whom the imperfect you and me. God is not looking for perfection. He's looking for connection. So any way you connect, any way you connect to God, whether you say a prayer, you give tzedakah, you light Shabbos candles, you eat kosher, you take a stand for, 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 for a Jew, you take a stand for Israel, our land, any way you connect, that's what God wants. That is who we are. So thank you very much, everybody. Good Shabbos. Good Shabbos, Fredo.